I'm just about with you at the moment. A very long flight yesterday. The pleasure of flying on a Dreamliner with Norwegian Airlines, where we have to be within 60 minutes of a nearby airfield, courtesy of Rolls-Royce Trent 1000 engines. Not great. Um, looked at the flight model when we got on and where we should have just gone like that, we sort of went like that. And I was thinking, hmm, 11 and a bit hours, what should be 9 hours 40? Anyway, we're here now. Um, we've had coffee and we're, we're ready to go. So what are we going to talk about? We are Faraday. Um, we're going to talk to you about the end of land-based commuting. We have got to bring an end to this land-based commuting. Uh, I live four years here in the Bay Area, and the 101 was a bane on many occasions. Um, but I can tell you, compared to London and the M25, it's a walk in the park. So, what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about uh, our team. So, who are we? Uh, I spent many years in the commercial aviation market. So, I've sold big jets, regional jets, regional airlines. Um, the regional model is an interesting one. Um, it doesn't really work. And it doesn't work because you can see Embraer 195s, 175s. Um, we've got Bombardier and Mitsubishi trying to work an awful lot through these 100-seat regional jets. And the ERJ 145s are just not economic. Um, so having been through that cycle, having been in that environment, and having seen what does and doesn't work, started to think about what does work. How can we actually change what we're doing? And it astonished me that we started flying in the early 1900s. We're still now driving to work. We're still going by coach and train. How have we allowed this to happen? We've allowed it to happen for a point that was made a little bit earlier on, which is bigger, faster, louder, blah, blah, blah. Um, we've forgotten about the short haul. You used to be able to fly from Croydon to Manchester in the UK. Can't do that now. Now you've got to go to airports. Now the problem you've got with going to the major airports is the fact that you basically are taking a slot. A slot is very valuable. If you look at Heathrow as a slot, it's hugely expensive. So if you've got an ERJ145 with 20 packs on board going to Aberdeen, when you could be landing 480 people from Bombay, that's a very expensive slot to be using for that. So that model is going to change, um, and that's starting to come. So we set up this company. Um, so in 2014, so I just set up Faraday uh, and launch it. And the guys we've put in around the team are basically guys who've come in around the sector. We've got about 100 years' worth of aviation experience behind the company. Uh, one of the brightest aerodynamic brains in the UK at the moment. I can say that because Ben is the mad crazy fool person who has decided to try and design a vehicle that can go 1,000 miles an hour on the ground. Even more lunatic, the person who's going to sit behind the wheel, uh, Mr. Green. Um, but in order to keep a vehicle on the ground at over 1,000 miles an hour, you have to have some pretty special aerodynamics. Um, these guys are going to be running. The Bloodhound ran, um, has done its first ground runs, uh, went up over 200 miles an hour. I believe at the end of this year, it's going to go up to sort of 400 miles an hour. And the crazy thing is, once they get to the current record, about 600, 700 miles an hour on the jet fighter engine, that's when they're going to launch their rockets and push for 1,000. It's going to be a spectacle, I can tell you now. So uh, Ben's involved in the project. Uh, he loves the, uh, the synergies between some of the design processes of Bloodhound and what we're doing. And a lot of the structural elements of Bloodhound will be incorporated in our aircraft. Um, and then he's got an export finance director for UK for aviation and uh, various advisors and people in the company. It means that we've basically amassed uh, a group of people who know aviation, know small businesses, know what we're trying to solve. So what are we trying to solve? Mobility. Um, as touched on, basically we have a, a number of situations right now where um, around the world you can be fleeced, for want of a better word, for going to certain areas. Um, to give you an idea, to go into London on a season ticket for an hour and a half journey will cost you £10,000 per year. To go from Cheltenham to London, which is a two-hour journey, if you go at peak time, £247 return. That's what happens when you capture a market. When you capture a market and you force people to have that choice and that choice alone, you can crank the price up. And that price goes up by 3% every year. Same rail network, same rail cars, 
same vehicles, and the price keeps going up by 3% every year. How? Why? This is why. It's because everybody is locked into this environment, and we still are. We've been doing it for years. Um, we're stuck into the road, the rail. We need to change that. There are some fundamental reasons why we can't change that, and we're working on those, and I'll come on to those in a little bit second. But just to give you an idea, average commute into London, 74 minutes, just by car. Um, as you see, people in some parts of the world just hang on the vehicle. They don't even get a seat. It's like if you can hang on to it, go for it. Um, but basically, people will make lifestyle choices based on the fact of whether they need to commute or not. Some people are spending over 50% of their salary to live in London because they don't want to commute. That's madness. This is 2018 for crying out loud. Why are we still doing this? So things have to change. Uh, and so we basically decided that we'd be having a look at this. But if you have a look at some of the data, uh, a lot of the sources from like Uber and uh, the guys at the uh, CAA and Airbus, etc., cetera, uh, are all... Uh, pointing us in the direction that this is definitely the next untapped market. This is something that has got to happen, and it is happening, and it's happening now. So, air mobility. We have heard the Uber Elevate Summit, and we've got lots of people getting very excited about mobility and VTOLs and everything else, which is all very good. Um, but what are we actually talking about? Um, we're talking about a problem, and the problem comes in three forms. The problem comes in three forms of noise, emissions, and cost of operations. Cost of operations is a very large one. If you cannot make your business case for this flight, it doesn't make any sense, you will go bust. There are turboprop operators going bust every year um, because some turboprop operations just are not viable. Um, if you look at the noise, noise is critical. We've been flying helicopters for decades. Why do we not have 10,000 Robinson R22s going to London every day? It's cheap enough. Small enough, but we don't have it. Why? Noise. It's as simple as that. London City Airport, prime piece of real estate for aviation, sitting in London, is open until 10.30 at night. Why? Noise. Half the day on Saturday, noise. Six flights on Sunday, noise. Noise is critical. So when people start talking about tuning noise, noise is very subjective. In this presentation this morning, we've heard four airplanes take off from nearby airport. Even with the PA system and, and, and broadcasting, you can hear aircraft. If that didn't exist, you'd have no objections. But I tell you now, wherever you live, if you turned around tomorrow and said you're going to put a runway at the back of your property, within five hours, there'll be a protest group. Within 12 hours, there'd be an activist group applying to their local minister, MP, senator, whatever. And within about a week, you'd have the first formal application to block you. Okay? People basically perceive aircraft and runways as noisy things that are going to really impact on their life in a very bad way. So noise is critical. If you are going to get into this market, noise has to be addressed. And I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a second. So what did we do? We decided to create something that solved the solution. Um, we didn't just create an airplane and then look for a market and find out how it could work. We actually designed something that has been created to solve the problem. The problem is urban environment. You cannot build an airfield in a city now. Real estate's too expensive. So that means you've got to use existing spaces. It means you've got to go in and out of very small spaces. So that means you need an aircraft that can take off and land in a very short space. Then, of course, people say, well, you could go VTOL. Yeah, it's very expensive. In terms of thrust and capability and payload, VTOL is very expensive. If you can take off and land in a very short distance, let's say, for example, less than 200 meters, taking off and landing less than 200 meters for a 2,500 kilo airplane doesn't really exist at the moment. Will do very shortly. Um, if you've got the ability to shroud the prop, the electric motors is not everything. Everybody thinks because it's electric, it's going to be quiet. You can get a Robinson R22 electric helicopter tomorrow if it's flown. Is electric the be-all and end-all? If you listen to the video of that helicopter flying, it sounds very similar to the existing Robinson R22 helicopter because it's got a rotor. So you've basically got to look at the thing from a complete package perspective. So if you're going to use a prop, as has already been alluded, the prop needs to spin slowly, which is interesting with some of the designs at the moment for air taxis where people are talking of having 36 different little fans spinning up at 25,000 RPM. 
That's going to be loud. And I'll come on to that in a bit as well. So if you can shroud that and put a slow spinning prop, and if you can basically contain all that noise, and you can get the short takeoff and landing capability, and if you can combine your power, so electric battery technology is a problem right now. There's no doubt about it. It basically is hindering us from doing this immediately. We've got limited range and capability. But that's because batteries are heavy. So people look at this and they go, well, why would you go three wings? We had three wings in 1916. Everybody thinks the Red Baron was the first with the three wings. I mean, forget it. The British had the Sopwith triplane in 1916, and the DR1 came out in 1918. But why? Because it lifts a lot. Why is that important? Because batteries are heavy. So if you can lift a lot of batteries, you can go further. We're only going to target 10 minutes worth of electric flight. And then we switch on to an internal combustion engine running a hybrid propulsion system. So we went out into the market, and when we launched in 2014, we looked at what was available. Are there any engines out there that do the job that we needed? No. So in 2016, um, we decided on creating a hybrid engine. Uh, the Hybrero hybrid propulsion system, and that was a joint venture. I'll come on to a little bit more of that in a second. But the aircraft itself is going to come in three configurations. So you're going to have the six, which is the VIP, six seat, nice luxury, private toilet, very nice. You're going to have the eight, far more coach like, get on, get off, treat it like a bus. And then the X. The X came along um, uh, as a result of some of the work we've been with creating, the, uh, the military variant stroke patrol variant. Um, because of its unique capabilities on the aircraft, uh, it can go further than a helicopter, faster than a helicopter, quieter than a helicopter, lower heat signature than a helicopter, lower radar signature than a helicopter. Suddenly that starts to play into certain categories very well. Um, the aircraft's already being assessed by certain groups around the world for some of those roles. So that's what we're doing. We're creating this beastie. Um, to a little bit more about the aircraft. Uh, triple box wing design. Uh, it's a patented design, and basically we've got the, the aircraft lifting a huge amount, and that was always done from day one. Now, what was also interesting was seeing Tina's presentation earlier with the um, first iteration of the aircraft that we had in 2014. Thank you for putting that up. That was our, um, that was our market stir, shall we say. If you noticed, it had a square duct on the back. Uh, that caused an awful lot of um, commentary. I have to say that was done with a little bit of design. Um, we had twin electric motors mounted, side mounted with the square box ducked at the back. You should have heard some of the stuff we had coming at us. But it created an awful lot of momentum. Um, we knew that what was going to be coming was this. Um, we knew that the, uh, the duct that we had here was designed to do a specific job, which is obviously to reduce noise and is also most efficient up to 200 knots. Um, if you go beyond 200 knots, get rid of the enormous great parachute that you're dragging behind you. All the studies from NASA, all the major universities, beyond 200 knots, a ducted design is an enormous dragging device that's just not worth it. Go to an open prop architecture at that point. Um, so basically, the aircraft will do the job. It will go up to 200 knots, hopefully. We're sitting at the moment about 160. Um, we're making some design tweaks and changes at the moment to push that speed up a bit at the present. Fixed landing gear, again, why have retractable gear? It's just added weight that you don't need. If you're only flying up to 200 knots, then a fixed gear would be fine. Beautiful thing about fixed gear is you can swap the fixed gear out for floats. Why is that important? Come back to the first point I made about urban environment. London, LA, New York, all the major cities have got water connected to them, financial hubs. There's your runway right there. Take off on the water. Why are takeoff landings difficult uh, on water? Landing speed. 16 degrees angle of attack, 40 knots, she's still lifting. It goes better than that, but I'm not going to tell you what those numbers are. Um, basically, we're tweaking this now. We're playing with it. Um, we've had some phenomenal data coming out in the last 12 months. Um, it's getting quite exciting. But basically, all carbon composite, it's a multi-mission aircraft. We don't say that we're an urban aircraft. We don't say that we're specific for the urban air market. This thing is going to do a load of different jobs. It's a load carrier. Uh, to give you an idea, we were approached from a cargo perspective of carrying capability. We put a 2,000 horsepower turboprop in the back of this. We lift 13 tons. We ran those numbers three weeks, five times by two different universities, both confirmed. That's a huge amount of weight. 
So she can lift an awful lot. It's quite exciting. Full glass cockpit, uh, unrivaled safety features in terms of if the ice packs up, you've got the electric. If the electric packs up, you've got an ability to put the aircraft down in a very small space. Comes with ballistic parachute recovery. Um, and that in itself has been a wonderful um, change in the market. The ability for people to blow a parachute to come down has been a fantastic uh, move for general aviation. Um, and basically, we're looking at something that's going to be incredibly cheap to operate, uh, low cost, uh, cost to acquire, uh, and basically an aircraft that can beat the noise, beat the emissions. Use the electric for takeoff, then switch on to the clean burning ice engine. The ice engine um, we're going to use is about 300 horsepower. It's a clean sheet design. Um, she will be running by the end of this year. Um, it is a stunning piece of kit. It weighs less than 100 kilos. So it's quite an impressive beastie. That combined with the electric motors and the power generation system, our whole hybrid system will bolt into the direct uh, box footprint of a Lycoming six-cylinder engine. So the whole lot. Engine, electric motors, batteries in that footprint. And that will be demonstrated by the end of the year. So that's the beastie. Why did we go down this path? We are using twin 150 kilowatt electric motors uh, combined in this package. Um, that is not the engine. That's just a representative image. The engine looks a little bit more funky than that. I won't say any more than that. Um, but basically, the idea is it's jet A fuel. Why jet A fuel? Um, general aviation needs to be moving away from Avgas. Uh, we've known that for a long time. So jet A is definitely the way to go. It's cheap. But more importantly, all the major biofuel work at the moment is going on for the commercial airlines. So if you can use the same fuel that's being designed for the commercial airlines, it makes an awful lot of sense. So it is going to be biofuel capable. If you want to run biofuel, you can. If not, run your jet fuel. But basically, it's a hybrid engine with roughly equivalent about 600 horsepower in combined power. So 300 horse off the electric motors and 300 horse off the internal combustion engine, all for less than 250 kilos all in. That gets exciting. So who is doing this? Um, basically, we've already built the hybrid engine for automotive. It was already done. We have a two-liter, six-cylinder, 550 horsepower engine that weighs 88 kilos. That was designed for a, a very well-known motor brand to do the, the uh, Le Mans race slippage. Um, basically, the engine was uh, something quite unique. So I turned to the guys, I've known them for a long time at ProDrive, and I said, I want to do something for aviation. I want to build something like that, but in an aviation configuration. I said, fine, no problem. So we set up the joint venture with Hybrero, and that was launched in 2016. And so very much like the Mahepa thing, uh, basically we are selling a modular engine there. It's going to be plug and play capable. In terms of avionics and the aircraft, Avidyne, uh, and university uh, groups currently at Swansea University doing a lot of the aircraft optimization work, and we're now starting work with other UK universities on the program. It's starting to get quite exciting. Last week, I was at the inaugural Urban Air Transport Group meeting uh, for the British government, uh, and that was run by the ADS. And so the first guys in part of that group, that's taken a long time coming. Um, and last year, I was advising British government on future flight policy. There were three aerospace companies in the room, Airbus, Rolls-Royce, and Faraday. Nobody knew who Faraday were when we came into the room. They knew who we were by the end of it. So the sector. If you look at the sector in terms of the GA sector, um, it's split thus. Uh, basically, sin single engine piston market is still the biggest out of the whole part of the GA market. So that's obviously the target market to go for. Um, Multi-engine market is dying. 149 odd aircraft, I think, or 130 aircraft sold last year, multi-engine pistons, absolutely dying. Why? Expensive to operate, expensive to get the licensing for. Um, and then you see helicopters, rotorcraft. So the whole vertical takeoff and landing thing, there's definitely market there if you can get it right. If you can make a VTOL that's silent, that market is enormous, absolutely huge. But you can't. So it's going to have some noise. I'll come on to that in a second. So what are we talking about here? Let's have a look at the market. Um, we've got the traditional. Uh, we've got the old-fashioned style six-cylinder engines, turboprop operations, helicopter operations, uh, all perfectly viable. They work in certain degrees. Not necessarily economic. Uh, not necessarily what we're going to need in order to stop using the road, stop using the rail, 
we've got to get a far more economic solution going. So how is that looking? Uh, we're looking at all sorts of different designs at the moment for urban mobility. We've gone with the fixed wing um, short takeoff and landing, so the e-stall market effectively. Um, you've seen the e-fan obviously demonstrated that we can do quiet aircraft when it flew up Paris and places like that. I mean, it really was. It was truly very, very quiet. Then we've seen some more, spoken with the Volocopter guys, obviously they're doing great interesting things at the moment, so the E-Hang. E-Hang is an interesting one. There's one video on the internet at the moment that doesn't have background music playing. <laughs> one. Go and have a listen to it. If that is going to fly anywhere near a city in the current noise level it's producing, it won't be anytime soon. It's so loud, it's astonishing. Um, and likewise, again, personally, and this is just our personal opinion, if you're going to create vertical lift, you need a huge amount of thrust. That thrust either comes from bigger rotors or it comes from smaller things spinning up very fast. Everybody that has ever gone anywhere near an F-35 jet trying to lift off vertically will know that whenever you're spinning something up very fast, it's very loud. So none of the current videos of some of these things are showing the actual noise level of their device. The technology of getting into the air vertically is not the challenge. Anybody can do it. You've got guys, there's one guy, he took a bathtub, attached electric motors to it, and flew around the field with a racing helmet on. I mean, it's not difficult. Vertical lift is not difficult. Can you make it an economic viable proposition that can actually be accepted by people in their backyards? That is the difficult bit. And then, of course, we had Uber Elevate and all sorts of new funky things, um, sort of vertical takeoff and landing, except that one. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> Omniplane. Absolutely. And that's the key point. Very good. Top, top points for you. We'll have a chat later. Uh, 1959. So some of these new designs we've just seen announced this week, very similar to what this was being happening in 1959. It's not a new problem and it's not a, uh, an issue about designing an aircraft to lift, it's how it operates. So um, in terms of market realities, um, we need to be operating in certain environments. So what are the problems? The environment is the problem. Uh, location, noise, um, I've got a slide on that specifically. Objections, green credentials, cost of land. It's astonishing how there isn't more eco coverage of the green flight side of things. We've discovered why that is, because aircraft are bad, period. They're dirty, noisy, horrible things. They haven't, the green lobby hasn't quite gotten its head around the fact that these things are becoming more economic, they're becoming a lot cleaner, and they're becoming a lot quieter. Um, air traffic network. Yeah, we're going to have 10,000 air taxis. Are we? Go and speak to your local flight controller and ask him if he's going to suddenly have an extra 2,000 dots on his screen on his current workload. Not happening for a long time. The whole infrastructure network has got to change. It's going to change. Corridors, flight tubes, areas of boundary that have got to change. So command and control becomes a very, very important issue. Why is that important? Because I've seen something quite a bit bigger than that thing over there go AWOL. And when it crash lands 25 miles away, it's a terrifying period of time when that vehicle is out of your control. When it's out of your control, it can land on a motorway, it can land on a school, it can land on anywhere. That was 30 years ago I saw that aircraft crash. Um, terrified the hell out of all of us. But we think it went through the ILS beam at RF Benson. Scrambled everything and flew off. Your controller's going, I've lost it. It's the worst words you ever hear if you're flying an unmanned air vehicle is the pilot saying, I've lost it. At that point, it's everybody running for phoning lawyers and where the hell's it going? Um, so if you talk about putting stuff over a city, we have got a long, long way to go before you even think about putting aircraft over a city where you've got 747s landing into Heathrow over a city with X number of people on board and X number of people underneath. If that aircraft goes outside of its tube, what do you do with it? Do you blow the chute on it? Do you bring it down? Do you land it on a bunch of school kids in a playground because you've just blown the chute and it's coming down? How do you protect it from EMP? The Americans lost their very latest stealth drone by an EMP pulse. 
The Iranians stood there catching it. Of course, it got confused once it blew the chute, landed, completely intact, paraded it on TV. Not good. Battery technology, that's changing. That's changing rapidly at the moment. That's quite exciting. There's some really interesting work going on right now. But again, as has been pointed out, what is the approved standard right now from the FAA, EASA, the Australian authorities, Canadian authorities, CAA? What is the unified standard right now that we're all agreed that we can sit around the table and go, that is what we're all going to fly? Hasn't been agreed yet. So that's a period of years that we've got to work on. Um, so the regulation is the key thing. Part 23, the new regulations, the new 19-page document to certify an airplane that actually works out as a table of contents to the remaining 5,000 pages that already exist. These are some of the problems the guys are working on at the moment and changing. But it is changing, and it is extremely exciting that it is changing because it's going to make this quite exciting. So noise, here's the key thing. Here's some just, I wanted to give you some background ideas. People talk about noise. You don't actually understand what noise means. What are we talking about volume-wise? A pneumatic drill, seven meters away, 95 decibels, okay? Uh, heavy diesel lorry, seven meters away, 85 decibels. Robinson R22 helicopter and overflight, 81 decibels. Um, Boeing 737 MAX, 73 decibels. The 737 MAX is now quieter at takeoff than an SR22 Cirrus. That's astonishing. Passenger jets now quieter than a four-seat prop. So these are what's happening. So what does that mean for us? It means that basically less than 60 dB. There it is. Hear that? Piston-engine aircraft. Noise people. Less than 60 dB. It has to be less than 60 dB. If it's anything above that, you're going to be facing the same objections these guys are getting. Look at Santa Monica Airport as a classic example. Um, so a quiet office is about 50 dB. You'll be doing very well if you got to that level, but less than 60 for sure. Where does this experience come from? 30 years worth of UAV experience. We were flying this stuff in the mid-80s. We had the world's first combat drone four years before Predator ever took to the skies. British government wouldn't back it, unfortunately. These things happen. American group came along, bought the assets, won an $80 million US Marine research contract. These things happen. Um, so basically, we've, we've been here, we've done it. So when people start talking about urban aircraft operations, autonomous aircraft operations, and boomed drones, we were doing it 30 years ago. Um, we're now doing it with a new version. So in terms of milestones, we've secured IP. Uh, we presented our vision back in 2014. A lot of the things that we were talking about now becoming reality, like people suddenly realizing that we're not going to have autonomous taxi straight off the bat. It's going to have to be piloted. From day one, the first air taxi operations are all going to be piloted. That is for sure. So some of the designs are already now uneconomic by the tune of 50%. Um, we've won joint venture awards. We've advised the British government on future flight policy. And this is our timeline. So basically, we started 2014. Uh, we pulled in a lot of our partners and worked on some of the technology in 2015, 16. 17, a bit more of a Bihar optimization on the design and the Hybrero engine design. And basically, in 2018, we're hoping to have the engine running by the end of this year. We're going to be relocating uh, and creating an R&D office at Swansea University, all going well. And then by 19, we hope to be having flight testing of that hybrid system. Um, that's our target at the moment, expanding into our prototyping facility where the technologies that we're developing for the aircraft will then be transferred onto a flying Bihar from 2020 onwards, uh, and that's for the six to eight seater. This is where we're at at the moment. Uh, we started flight testing scale models. Uh, we've learned some really interesting data that didn't get thrown up on the CFD model, um, but basically the aircraft is doing what we're hoping to do. That's the UAV configuration. So that one's been designed specifically for a military project. I can't tell you about that either. So here's a quick final video just to wrap it up. One minute.
before anybody asks me, the solar panels on the wings are not for the propulsion. But if you park it in Dubai, it's going to be cool when you come back to the aeroplane. If you park somewhere cold, it's going to be warm when you come to without cannibalizing your propulsion batteries. So we're just incorporating that with the uh, composite. So there we are. That's where we are. Uh, this particular chap said an excellent comment. I don't know if uh, any of you recognize him, Mr. Dean Sigler. Uh, he said, we're a very interesting addition um, to the market. Uh, we've, we've been going four years. It's been hard slog. We've actually had tier one aerospace companies completely change policy and tact in the time we've existed to now try and fit in and compete. Um, and that's quite satisfying. When you're seeing companies completely changing their vision to, to match what we're putting forward. And a lot of the things we put forward, uh, I know have been used by those companies because some of the sentences on our website I created, there are certain keywords within there that I have used to identify when people steal that and use it in their own presentations, as one major tier one company did in November of last year. So that's where we are. Um, it's exciting time. We're starting to really start making stuff now and, and demonstrating it and delivering it. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions you've got. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. That was just a fabulous talk. I, I know everyone is eager for the break to network and talk about what we've heard this morning. So I'm afraid we have time only for this one question, but it's an important one uh, for the whole audience. The ducted fan device seems to be the key to the enabling low noise. Uh, you have probably some top secret breakthroughs as to w how the duct is done, how mm -hmm. it's uh, filled with sound deadening material, how it interplays with the tips of the rotors to kill the vortex. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Uh, the whole world, of course, of VTOL flight wants to know how to quiet these ducted thrusters. Mm -hmm. You've got some breakthroughs. Yeah, we, um, when we looked at the project, we decided to break this down a bit. So we're actually working on four technologies right now. One is the prop, one is the duct, one's the hybrid engine, one's the control system. For the regulatory authorities to understand that this isn't a multi-engine device, this is a single propulsion device, therefore it needs a single stick, not two sticks. Um, that control system is one project we're working on. The engine itself, obviously, we've discussed, but the duct is, is quite an exciting one. And as you say, it's the composition, it's the construction, it's the, um, the acoustic reduction capability by how much? How much are you reducing by? Um, yes, that work is ongoing at the moment. Can I tell you any details? No, um, because they are effectively IPable elements in their own right. Those are four standalone projects that will all combine into the BHA. But thank you ever so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.